Well, brethren, today we're going to talk about something very important, and it is how to manage your finances God's way. Because, you know, as we think about that subject, the importance of managing your finances God's way is very, very relevant. Because God is working out His purpose of bringing billions of sons into His family to share in the rulership of the universe. In this life, we are developing the character and mind of God which we need in order to fulfill our future responsibilities. So we must learn to put God first in every area of our lives. So today we are going to look at a major area of our lives which will, to a large degree, determine our position and reward in God's kingdom. And for some of us, may determine whether we will be in God's kingdom. This is the area of our personal finances. How we manage our finances is vitally important to God. So go to Luke chapter 16, please, because God is very concerned about how we spend our money. In Luke chapter 16, and uh, we are in verses 10 and 11, we read about the uh, faithful servant. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? So God expressly states that, you know, what we do with the comparatively small amount of wealth we allow, He allows us in this physical life shows what we would do with the vast power, authority and wealth we would inherit as His sons in ruling the universe. So this is one of the major areas of our lives in which we are being tested, evaluated and judged every day by Jesus Christ. As you know in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 17, it says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? In Matthew 6 verse 21, it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So just as our faith is determined and actually demonstrated by our works, we demonstrate whether or not our hearts are in God's work by how we spend our money. Any of us who takes you know, lightly the serious responsibility of properly managing our finances takes lightly what God has in store for us. Managing our finances God's way will help us qualify for a position of authority in God's kingdom. A failure to do so may disqualify us for any position. Now many in the Church of God, by the way they manage their finances, by the way they scrimp on offerings and spend their money for material things, show their hearts are on the material things of this world rather than on seeking the Kingdom of God. Now when I say the Church of God, of course I mean that in the widest possible sense. We are indeed aware that we are living in predominantly uh, Laodicean area in Laodicean era of God's church. Now, how are we handling our finances? That's another question. As we think about how we do that, it is important to keep in mind that we should not be materialistic in our approach to life. Because God wants all of us and all of his people to prosper. In the third epistle of John in verse 2, John writes to faithful Gaius, he says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So obviously, you know, God wants us to enjoy the physical things of this life because otherwise we will not be having Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 18, which says, Here is what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all of his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life which God gives him, for it is his heritage. So yes, indeed, God wants us to enjoy the physical things of this life, but certainly he doesn't want us to set our hearts on the pleasures, pastimes and material pursuits of this physical life. It is a matter of our attitude and approach. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 31, says, and those who use this world as not misusing it. So we are to be as those who use this world as not misusing it. Misusing it for the form of this world is passing away. The form of this world so is passing away. In other, word, in other words, God allows us to use, but he does not want us to abuse or use too fully the physical things in this world. 
he wants us to realize they have a part you know in this physical life for character development but then pass away in second corinthians chapter 4 in verse 18 it says while we do not look at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporary but the things which are not seen are eternal so basically brethren we need to understand that which we can see taste feel hear and smell so that which you know we can discern with our physical senses is not the reality you know the physical things around us that which means so much to us and appeals so strongly to our physical senses and pulls of the flesh are only temporary eventually to be destroyed with this world when god has finished using this physical earth as a training ground for adding sons to his ruling family i'm sure you're familiar with second peter chapter 3 verse 10 through 13 which says but the day of the lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up therefore verse 11 since all these things will be dissolved what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of god because of which the heavens will be dissolved being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat nevertheless we according to his promise look for new heavens and new and a new earth in which righteousness dwells now therefore no physical thing is of lasting value and the pursuit of physical comforts food clothing and pleasure should not be our aim or goal in our lives and should not consume the majority of our time nor fill the majority of our thoughts what we will retain after this physical life, brethren, is God's spirit and the character we have built, not the physical possessions we have accumulated. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, the Apostle Paul speaks about the root of all evil. Starting in verse 6, 1 Timothy 6, 6, 6, he says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows." Now we can add to all this Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 23, which tells us that we should not lay up treasures on earth. Matthew 6, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So God counsels us, to lay up treasures in heaven, to set our affections on things above, not on things uh, on this earth. In Colossians 3, 3, it says, For you died. How did we die? Well, we died, of course, through baptism, as it's explained in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. We die through baptism, figuratively, and then we are now in the newness of life. So, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So, you know, Christ is above, brethren, in the heavens. So we are to set our affections on things above. Now, we do, we do this by putting our treasure, our money, into God's work rather than lavishing it on ourselves out of proportion to what we should be spending on ourselves in view of our level or station in life. 
we must be single-mindedly seeking God's kingdom because in the same Colossians 3 we have verse 24 telling us knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance you serve the Lord Jesus Christ so it is utterly impossible for us carnal human beings to set as a goal the attainment of material things the status symbol creature comforts and physical pleasures of this life and at the same time to wholeheartedly seek God's kingdom and his righteousness well in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 2 we have a question posed to us Isaiah 55 and verse 2 why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance so we who understand god's plan we are brethren without excuse because the spiritual gen gentiles of this world they do not have the perspective or the understanding to lay up treasures in heaven by properly spending their money but how about us have we been giving in to the pressures of this materialistic society in which we are living or can we say honestly before god that we are seeking his kingdom first in every way including the way we manage our finances now speaking about that we need to also understand that yes, you know, how we're handling our finances, speaking about that, we need to understand that God indeed knows our needs. In Matthew 6, verse 25 to 31, Jesus Christ says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by warring, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Verse 28. Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, verse 31, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? So God doesn't want us to be very anxiously concerned about our basic needs of food, drink and clothing. Now how much less then should we be concerned about other things in this physical life which are not really needs. And it is amazing how people spend so much money on various things that are not really of any necessity. Now in verse 32... For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Well, you see, the Gentiles, those who do not know God and who don't have the goal of someday becoming God, they seek after material things. And I think we're all witnesses of that, you know, all around us. But we, as converted sons and daughters of God, whose eyes have been opened and enlightened, we of all people should not be overly concerned about things pertaining to this physical life, and realize that God will and He does provide for us. Also, we know that we are to live by faith. Don't we know that? In Matthew 6, verse 33, is one of those memory scriptures but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And then comes verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So, you see, God promises us that he will provide for our needs if we do seek his kingdom first, brethren. He wants us to learn to live by faith. Now we must trust Him to provide for our needs. Now it is natural to trust God and exercise faith, but that is what we must do if we 
set ourselves to manage our finances God's way. Now, as a way of life, you know, God wants us to look to Him and trust Him in everything. So our attitude must be that of faith and complete confidence in God. This should be our attitude and approach in managing our finances. You see, we must first of all set our hearts on God's kingdom and His work, not the things of this world. Secondly, we must have faith in God that He will provide all our needs and also any additional material blessings He decides to re you know, we really should, should have. In Psalm 34, verse 10, it says, The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. So we also have some principles, brethren, there. Principles, you know, financial principles, God's financial principles, you might say. So we are to obey those principles, of course, because we have seen what our attitude and approach should be. Now let us look at some specific principles we must follow in managing our finances God's way. The first of those principles is pay your tithes faithfully. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 8 is the famous question God posed to mankind. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Well... Do individuals in God's church steal first, second, and third tithe, brethren? Well, you bet they do, because every year before the feast in all WCG, we discovered literally dozens of members, we should call those members, we should put them under quotation mark, dozens of members who had stolen from their second tithe, either by failing to save it or by borrowing from it. Now, there are dozens, perhaps hundreds more, who were not discovered, but, you know, again, God knew, as God knows everything. And it was found that in the last century, the leading men in the church, men being considered for ordination as deacons or even ministers, they did not faithfully pay even their first tithe. And these, according to Malachi chapter 3 verse 9, are cursed with a curse. You are cursed with a curse, Malachi 3, 9, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Well, if you know there, there are any specific, any such individuals among us now, well, they'll be cursed financially now, and if they don't repent, they'll be cursed for all eternity and perish in the lake of fire. This perhaps may not be popular to say, but somebody has to say it, and the true preachers of the Word of God will certainly say it clearly and underline it. Now there are others who paid their tithes but grudgingly because many hated to see their third tithe year approaching. With this kind of an attitude they too were cursed financially brethren. God will never prosper them. In Job chapter 41 we do have a statement and a question and verse 11 job, job 41 verse 11 who has preceded me that i should pay him everything under heaven is mine so you see we need to remember that god owns everything even us in first corinthians chapter 6 verses 19 and 20 we have the description of our situation or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is which are God's. Now, of course, you know, your income and everything you own belongs totally to God. He requires you to pay the first tenth to Him through His work. The second he commands you to save in order to keep his feasts. And the third tenth, he required you to pay every third year out of a seven-year cycle as a form of welfare to help widows, orphans, strangers, and his ministers. Then, once you have discharged these obligations, God gives you the rest. 
However, God still has prior claims on part of it. Then, another principle is, remember the poor. Leviticus 19, verse 9 and 10. Leviticus 19 and 9. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. And you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So you see, God made special provision in Israel for the poor and the needy to acquire food. Now this was a command from God. He is just as concerned about the poor among his people today, brethren. Many places in Proverbs show God's concern for the poor. In Proverbs, for example, chapter 19, verse 17, Proverbs 21, and verse 13, and 28, verse 27. But, you know, how can we give to the needy today? Well, the primary way is by contributing a regular amount to a local fund if there is a larger congregation. Now, that fund traditionally, you know, was administered by local ministers for persons in need in the local area who do not qualify for third tithe help. So it doesn't have to be a large amount. Well, rather, it should be a small amount contributed on a regular basis. Now, a guideline <laughs> might be about, you know, one half of 1% of each paycheck or several dollars a month depending on one's income. Because we are speaking about remembering the poor. Now, in Luke chapter 14, verse 12, he speaks about Jesus Christ as he responds. Then he sa also said to him who invited him, where you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite, invite you back and you be repaid. So you see, in addition to regular donations, there are other ways that we can give to the poor. We can invite them to dinner on occasion. We tend to invite, of course, over for dinner only those who, whose company we enjoy or those who will return the invitation. Well, that is not wrong at times, but you know, you'll be blessed if you also entertain the needy. Another principle is to lay up treasure in heaven, as we hold already read. So after you have faithfully paid your tithes and given to the poor, realize that you still have not put one cent of your treasure into God's work, because the tithes are not ours, and, you know, the other, even though commanded of God, did not go into the work. You know, your treasury is what you have left after you pay your tithes. And it is through our offering that we, as it says, lay up treasure in heaven. Now notice again Malachi, but this time chapter 3 and verse 8. Malachi chapter 3 verse 8, God says, He had been robbed of tithes and offerings. Well, this means regular offerings as well as the special offerings that God commanded for the holidays. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, we read that during the Feast of Tabernacles, the law which says in verses 16 and 17, Three times a year shall your males appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of of tabernacles and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God which he has given which he has given you so offerings you know are an absolute requirement just as much as tithes are the difference is that God sets the amount for his tithes but he leaves the amount of the offerings up to us so this is the gorge that indicates just how much our hearts are in God's, in God's work. Herbert Armstrong used to say again and again that those who do not have their hearts in the work of God are not growing spiritually, while those who do have their hearts in the work grow steadily and continuously. So we see the principle in Matthew 6 verse 21 that there, you know, there was a that where a man's treasure is, his heart 
will be also. So those who are not diligently putting their treasure into God's work, they do not have their hearts in it. And God does not need our money, but he has given us a tremendous opportunity to be a part of this end time work, which is fulfilling the office, you know, that we have and the uh, purpose of the purpose of uh, of preaching the gospel for a witness around the world and also also fulfilling the Ezekiel's commission now i hope i hope that on the sabbath day i'll be i'll be able to give you a message about the thir 13th prophecies in the book of Ezekiel it will be a succinct review of those prophecies and we are going to see you know how uh, important and interesting that is and why the Ezekiel's commission has remained to us you know and with us to this day then another issue we need to keep in mind as we regard that as we are analyzing the topic how to manage our finances God's way well the fourth area is to ensure your future by investing in God's work well, the principle is give according to your blessings. In Luke chapter 21, verse 1 through 4, it says, And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the sanctuary, and he saw also a poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, Truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God, but she out of her poverty put in all the likelihood, livelihood that she had. So, you see, God is not concerned with the amount per se, and sh we shouldn't be concerned about that either. So, he's not concerned about, he's not concerned with the amount, the amount of our offerings. He wants us actually to give an offering that reflects the degree to which we have been blessed and which reflects our awareness and appreciation of his blessings. Now, most of members of God's church in America and Canada, they've been blessed above measure in every way, not just physically. By, you know, but by the nature, they are unthankful for most of the blessings they have. Instead of naturally desiring to show gratitude through offerings, the more they get, the more they naturally covet and lust for. Deuteronomy chapter 16, in verse 17, we read that, And you shall roast and eat it in the place which the Lord your God chooses, and in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. So the principle of giving, the principle of giving is that we should give according to the blessings God has given us. As God increasingly prospers us, we should increase our offering at least in proportion to the increase we receive, if not more. Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we have two relevant verses to this topic, verse 6 and 7, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 and 7. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So here is a remember, here is a principle that is to remember what you sow this year in offerings to God's work, you know determines to what extent God will bless you financially next year. So if a man has a bumper crop of wheat, sells it and leaves it up on the profits, failing to invest in seeds and machinery for the next year, he fails. And the same, the same is the case with us. So it is, you know, with us as well. If you have spent your extra money lavishing physical things on yourself and have neglected investing sufficiently in God's work this you know this year you will not prosper financially next year it's a simple equation the extent to which you give this year largely determines the extent to which God will bless you next year since all God's holidays are over for this year we can now ensure 
that 2021 would be a prosperous year for us by our generous offerings this coming year. Now, if you're not being blessed now as a result of not showing generously in the past, not sowing generously in the past, well, you have to break the cycle. You have to begin to give more, realizing that you are not being blessed because you have sowed sparingly. And this may for a time require real sacrifice, but if your attitude is right, you have an absolute guarantee from God that He will prosper us. And in the, all this process, we need to keep in mind that we are to go into partnership with God. Because God is in the business of bringing sons into his family. He's carrying out this business, this work, through his work on earth. And he has called us to have a part in it. He has called us to become partners with him. Now we have a certain amount of capital, which is what we have left after paying our tithes and all our living expenses. Our entire approach toward managing your, our finances should be to have a as much capital as possible to invest in God's work. You know, it is the only concern on earth that will really pay off. Investments in God's work, which are our offerings, will pay off in blessings here and now and for all eternity in God's kingdom. Now, a large portion, you know, should be carefully set aside each payday and plan for the larger investments on the holidays because your holiday offerings especially refer whether you are taking seriously the partnership to which God has called you. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19 through 21. You see our treasure is not our tithes but our offerings interesting enough you know because that which we lavish on ourselves will perish but our investment in God's work will ensure our future as well as blessings here and now and will provide the means for others to be called in this age as well as it says in Luke chapter 16 the uh, gospel of Luke chapter 16 verse 9 and I say to you this verse says, Make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. Then will you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Now those were the principles, brethren, the principles of tithing, we might say. And now we have come to the area of free moral agency, you might say. Actually, it is, you know, the choice that is before us. Choose whom you will serve. Because we all realize that the work of God is the best investment that we can make. We all know this intellectually. And from what I've seen this year, we're investing in God's work rather than in anything in this world. But as a way of life, is this our approach in managing our finances, you know? Well, perhaps it is, at least not to the extent it should be. Because if we fall short, let us resolve to change. Let us resolve to begin to manage our finances with a new and different approach. Now, certainly we cannot buy our way into the kingdom of God because it is a gift of God. But by managing our finances God's way and by striving to invest as much as possible in His work through our offerings, we are building character which will qualify us for a position in that kingdom by proving ourselves faithful in what in, in that which is least we show that we will be faithful in much in the future now this then is the crux of managing our finances God's way brethren God requires that we pay tithes give to the poor and give offering our choice is only whether we will obey God in these matters, but the amount of offerings we give in comparison to what we could give clearly shows our attitude and approach you know, to managing our finances. If, if we allow ourselves something 
whether it be a new home, car, television, set, or even a night out, which cuts into the amount we should be giving as an offering, well, based on, the, on our capacity to give, we are robbing God. Our attitude is wrong. We have set our hearts on that material pleasure or thing, whatever it might be. This is a form of idolatry, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Colossians 3, verse 5, it says, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Well, God plainly sees whether, you know, the emphasis in our life is on acquiring or envying material things or on putting our treasure into his work as a type of investment for the future. Well, you see, he can clearly see whether we are living by faith and trusting him to provide not only, you know, not only our needs, but also to provide any special blessings he might want want to give us or whether we are constantly making provision for the flesh in our approach to managing our finances now no no man can serve two masters we know that from matthew chapter 6 verse 24 we can't serve the true god and continue to spend most of our time and money on other things go to first kings chapter 11 first kings 11 verse 21 and Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. You see, the time has come to make a choice. If God be God, brethren, then follow him, trust him, and obey him and begin to manage your finances his way. Our eternal reward actually depends on it.